Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring Sys Admin Expert, Don Pizzette. Security Specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and this week we are not joined by Don Pizzette. <laughs> and you know what? We're not joined by Daniel Lowry either. Uh, it's, you know... July, vacations, uh, illnesses, those, those things happen. Hurricanes, I don't know. Or they just may not want to be here. Right or, now. yeah, or they, yeah, they actually saw the show from last week <laughs> and uh, have made the right decision. But let's go ahead and welcome in our guest in-house first. We have uh, Mr. Wes Bryan joining us. Hey, Wes, hey, how everybody. are you today? Oh, I'm great. Uh, I'm uh, glad to be here. I'm so glad I can't talk. I'm speechless. And, no, and if anybody knows me, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a break from filming. What, what were you guys filming today? Uh, we're doing uh, our ventures into the new class. Cloud Plus exam that is Ooh, out. Um, great exam there. And um, yeah, how, it's a how lot of fun. How topical for today. And you Absolutely. are joined in that show and today here by Mr. Ronnie Wong, uh, who is a frequent contributor to the podcast <laughs> these days. How are you doing, yeah, Ronnie? I, I don't know if that was on purpose. I, I really don't. <laughs> and you're the last call. Yeah, that's I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'll be honest I think with you. so. Uh, and speaking of the last call, uh, we are joined by Dr. James Stanger from Contia, who is the chief technology evangel evangelist. Uh, Dr. Stanger, how are you doing today? Doing great, man. How are you guys doing? Doing uh, yeah, wonderful. Doing good. Yeah. I got to say, last time we had you on, it looked like uh, Chernobyl behind you. And yeah, yeah it, it was pretty much Chernobyl. Yeah. Is, it, is it still there just behind it, what it it, I assume is a sheet? The elephant's foot or whatever that thing melted uh -huh. into, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's just right over here. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, yeah. I have a very nice bookshelf here now. Uh, and here's something, look, earthquake. <laughs> it's, it's a background. That's it's amazing. a background. It's fake. But I know James, so there's probably two or three guitars within hand's reach. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Right over here. Yeah, very good. Very one. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got, uh, 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 ignore the man behind the bookshelf. <laughs> Please do not play those because, uh, YouTube copyright rules. That's we will right. be, just banned That's immediately cool. when you start no Stairway to Heaven. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's get into our first segment and get to know Dr. Stanger for those who have uh, have not met him before. And our first segment, Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, James, the way this is going to work is we are going to ask you about five questions. You have five minutes to answer them. And when we get to the end, if you run over time, we will buzz you. <laughs> and it will sound like that. And uh, let's go ahead and get started and put five minutes on the clock. So I'll ask you the first question. I think most people uh, watching kind of have a good idea at this point what CompTIA is, and we've been focusing on CompTIA this month as well, so they've definitely talked about it. But can, you, uh, can we kind of understand what your role is in the organization? What, what does a chief evangelist mean, and, and what's your day-to-day -day look like? Usually, we I spend most most of my time explaining what a chief technology evangelist does. I mean, that's just that's just the gig, you know. I remember they came up with that title. I'm like, well, it's a little whiz bang. Do we really want to do that? And they're like, well, James, you're kind of whiz bang at times too, so <laughs> it's appropriate. Uh, so, as a chief technology evangelist, my job is to work with IT pros uh, around the world. Um, I also create a lot of videos and things like that, which I've done right there in in Gainesville. Um, but uh, and these videos are for our Cert Master Learn products, etc. But mostly, what I do is I go around uh, now these days virtually uh, and talk to uh, hiring uh, managers, uh, working IT pros and things like that, uh, basically in getting the word out. Uh, for example, I uh, helped do a train the trainer not too long ago uh, and uh, for the st state of California. But we had people from around the, frankly, around the world, but certainly around the U.S. Uh, joining in on that. And that was for Security Plus, uh, basically getting instructors up to speed about uh, teaching the new Security Plus. So we've had, uh, I have a lot of fun talking with folks. Uh, in fact, before the, just during the pandemic, I think I got back from Japan and that's when our CEO called up and said, James, you know, let's, uh, we're not going to be traveling for a little while. Oh. I'm like, I wonder how long that'll last. And, you know, <laughs> a couple weeks. that's been a little interesting. <laughs> so um, as a chief technology evangelist, uh, traditionally, I've done a whole lot of travel. Um, but these days I do a whole lot of travel via the microphone and, and Zoom, et cetera. And uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, talking to people about the latest uh, security trends, for example, or about how people are finally moving to the cloud and actually using it rather than talking about it, things like that. So it's been fun uh, being a chief technology evangelist. James, are you able to participate in more things now that you're not really physically traveling uh, to actually do the things you were once doing uh, yeah, since so the pandemic? Much. 
Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, what just, uh, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago at four in the morning, I was talking to folks in India and I'll be India and I'll be doing that again. Uh, but you know, just in the last couple of months, it's been, uh, Jamaica, Europe, South America, uh, all across the, the U S uh, doing things with Japan. So it's been, yeah, in many ways you could argue, you get, you get the, the word out more. And it's interesting to see how uh, this technology that we've been, that we're using been relying on the last year and a half has been around for some time. I think it's just taken the world a, a little while to realize that it was there and uh, at their you know, disposal. James, I want to ask you a question kind of surrounding your interests. You know, when it comes to interest, uh, I know that you tend to lean uh, in the cybersecurity uh, direction uh, with some of the consulting that you're involved in. Is that because that's uh, one of the things you're most interested in? You know, I love I love doing it. I, the way I got into this, when I first started getting into IT, and we're talking 20 years ago, over 20 years ago in the late 90s, uh, I remember I had uh, the good luck to uh, happen upon a course that I was developing and I knew nothing about, re I knew a little bit about IT maybe, uh, mostly a lot of web stuff, but I uh, basically a person who was a really good writer, a uh, really good, uh, very good security person. In fact, he's vice president of uh, security for Target now. He cleaned up that mess and is doing a great job. Yeah, you know, that mess back in 2013, he's doing a fantastic job. Uh, in fact, I did a presentation with our, an RSA with him uh, a couple of years ago, just before this whole thing went down. Uh, the COVID. Well, anyway, um, I was lucky enough to, to uh, he said, look, I don't have time to write this up. And, it's, and everybody said, well, James, pretty good writer. You guys get this together. And we put together three courses. And I think it was an over a weekend. And trust me, they were interested. They were courses that had a long life uh, over many years. So that's how I got interested in the security side of it. And the reason why security is interested in me, because in some ways it, how should I say it? It's the kind of greatest manifestation of what IT is, which is problem solving and troubleshooting and problem solving. And I love troubleshooting and problem solving. It's really fun. Um, and in some ways, uh, uh, the best way you can do that is, is in the security field in some ways. Yeah, that makes sense. So we had uh, Randall Edwards on last week, and we talked a little bit about Data Plus. Um, so I, yeah. I'm curious, in, in terms of roadmaps, uh, you know, that, that's coming out soon. Are there other new things coming out? Are you guys focusing more on some of the updates I know you guys have been doing recently to, to other courses? You know, we've got Data Plus coming out. Is it Data Plus or Data Plus? We don't Let's know. Do both here. Which, which is it, uh, guys? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not data. sure. I'm going with data. I'm going to say data. Yeah, data. I think data yeah. is a character in, um, you know, that, that space episode series so we don't get mm -hmm. sued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 data plus is, is data the consensus. Plus. That's what I'm going with. Yeah. Now you so know, with I was so gonna, with data, I'm going to call it data plus. Just perfect, for that. please. You know, uh, James, you had um, storage plus for a while. How's this going to differ? You know, what's so uh, utterly different, completely different. It's a great question. Storage plus was basically uh, uh, in a, in a partnership and with a great great outfit out of Colorado. Uh, um, but what we found with storage plus is that that very much focuses on how to store things, you know, data at rest, data in motion kind of thing. With, with, with data plus, with data plus, it's all about um, uh, business intelligence, uh, data analytics. This is not a data science sort of thing. When I say data, to me, when I, there's a division. Data science is the type of thing that is the purview of uh, people who have been in that profession of, of data or data. Uh, and information for many decades or whatever. Data intelligence is something that's more tactical. Uh, and it's something that uh, always, that focuses on what it means to create, uh, to take random data, data, and then turn it into actionable information. See, and like, so it's very different from the storage side of things. Yeah, I like this process where we just say it both ways each time. There we go. There we data, go. data, data, <laughs> data. Well, you, do need, you yeah. do need redundancy and data. data. Exactly. Yeah, data, data. Uh, <laughs> and my, my last question for you, I know we've, we've gone over time in this segment, but yeah, you know, you're, you're Dr. Sanger, so come on. Um, how, how did you survive the great heat wave of Seattle of 2021? You know, well, you know, first of all, it was hard to survive because nobody could agree about how many degrees it was, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, how, how hot it got. I'll say 113. Some people say 115. Doesn't matter. All of that is unprecedented for Olympia, yeah. Washington. A hot, an extremely scorching hot. You know, we never quite survived it. The earth has lost its orbit and is hurtling towards the sun lawn spontaneously catching on fire is like 94 degrees so nobody uh, in in recorded history had never been recorded that high it's about 113 even though john mcglinchy our senior our executive vp of uh, of uh, sales he was making fun of me because he lives in palm desert you know palm you know where it's 100 yeah, but he has air conditioning degrees. 
shade. Yeah. But he has air conditioning. <laughs> I, I seriously, I think over half the homes up here in Olympia don't even have air yeah. conditioning. Yeah, because so that was an interesting 75 couple. in the summer. Normally you open the windows and it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. OK. Uh, let's not exaggerate. It's uh, yeah. 70 degrees here. Today. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it's over. You've made it. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't melt. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish summer here was three days. Oh, man, that would be great. Gainesville, and be 70 great. degrees. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Sanger, while we have you here, let's go ahead and get to our next segment, which is science and tech news. Stay tuned for science and technology. And now, back to the Anchor Desk. All right. Well, we talked uh, a little bit last week about the Kaseya ransomware attack, and that's kind of been the big news that that uh, people have been focusing on uh, this last week. But I, I know that you kind of have a, a little bit of an interesting take on this, and I want to hear uh, you, you have the concept of the attack du jour syndrome, and I'd like to know what that means and how, how it's something we can avoid. You know, it used to be something that an expert uh, or, or a person who is knowledgeable in security and IT could say, well, let's talk about the last attack, right? And then that had a lifespan of a few months. And so you could kind of hang whatever point you want to make on that attack. Well, they're happening so fast now. It's, it's absolutely bewildering, not just for the novice, but for the people who are uh, experienced in this. And I think it's probably a good idea to get away from the attack du jour syndrome and kind of think, what are kind of the major issues here that are that are addressing us? And there's really kind of four of them, right? You know, uh, uh, you could argue it's uh, the advanced persistent threat, first one. The, uh, the second, the ransomware. Uh, third, I think uh, uh, DDoS, and then you know you could call the fourth one supply chain if you want, or even misconfiguration that might be a fifth. But I think if we basically create kind of a, a series of categories to hang all of these attacks off of, maybe it can bring some more context. So you're, you're saying that, that people just get too uh, kind of myopic and just focused on oh, here's, yeah. here's what happened today and I got to fix that. And they're ignoring maybe the, the greater issue that's, that's taking place in, in their I think, network. yeah. And I think the, I think the greater issue is I wrote an article on it uh, um, and I've been talking it about, about here. I think the greatest issue is that uh, we are all using very modern technologies and, and developing some pretty interesting things as we transform the world into remote work and Etc. But I think we're still following what I call cowboy IT practices, which is reliance on older technology, uh, older techniques, but using newer technologies. That's that's a problem. You have a mismatch, kind of divide by zero error there, um, and uh, you're not engaged engaging in proper monitoring of things. That's why you have two supply chain attacks, major ones in six months, right? Because remember, we used to talk about solar winds. Remember that all that time ago, <laughs> six months, right? You and know, I mean, when, before that, yeah. Well, and it's funny because, see, you could talk about Target even before that, right? You could talk about the Target attack for about a year or two. Now you can't even talk about anything, you yeah. know, because we don't even talk yeah. about uh, those things anymore. But strangely enough, if you think about what happened with Target back then and then with Solar Winds, and then with, is it Kaseya or Kasiya? See, this yeah, is- Yeah, I was going to, dad joke here. How do we Kaseya that? And I'm oh, still on data. I'm yeah. Not, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. We haven't even got past data yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that Kaseya pun was really bad. I guess I'll have to Kaseya later. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yes, it's just getting worse. <laughs> it's, and it goes Almost down as bad as the attacks. <laughs> uh, but notice they're all, spi they're all um, <laughs> spiraling out of control. Notice how they are all supply chain attacks. They're really, in a sense, the target attack, right? Uh, an HVAC vendor yeah. came in, right? Supplying a service, right? And, and caused that problem. And we see the same sort of thing happening. So to me, if you can tie things back to a few things, and I think, uh, uh, kind of those four things, five things I was talking about. The other thing I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about is uh, if we had better monitoring going on, that would move us away from that cowboy IT uh, mentality. And by monitoring, even monitoring the data streams of trusted systems. It's like, well, I, I trust that update from Microsoft. I, I can forget about that update now. You know, it's, it's trusted. Uh uh, you know there ain't no trust anymore, and I, you know, I guess we could talk about zero trust here, but the to zero me, trust it's more. Model, yep. But it's it's that monitoring is so vital, and frankly, I don't think a lot of folks really catch on to to what it means to do that kind of what I call postmodern monitoring of systems. Well, it seems like that the reporting that goes on here though see, tries to grab whatever attention that the public is going to read, and so instead of actually focusing on these topics, which may be a little bit harder to explain. They know that they can tie it back to an organization. They know they can actually tie it back to something that will have a memory hook. So is it just bad reporting or 
or are we as IT professionals really not focusing in on the primary targets that we should really be focusing in on? Uh, it's a great question. I think, first of all, the reporting is uh, about, uh, you know, security or cybersecurity, whatever you want to call that, is it, frankly, been, is generally abysmal. And you're right, there is a memory hook that they want. So they can, you know, focus on that evil CEO of whatever team or that incompetent person of whatever uh, team. It's, it's a major issue. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that these are complex issues that have led us to this attack surface. And so you're not going to sound bite or memory hook your way out of it. Uh, it. So it requires some serious thought and some serious work. And, I, you know, a lot of folks aren't interested in that kind of serious work. Well, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, you, you can be very reactionary to these kind of attacks and, and see something that happened and say, oh, I've got to go patch that before that happens to me, as opposed to actually being out ahead of these things and... and uh, and thinking ahead and, and what's going to happen. And one of the great ways to do that would be through IT security training. Mm -hmm. uh, I, well, I know you guys have, uh, you guys have a couple things coming up actually event wise. You've got partner summit and channel con. Are those, uh, those virtual events still this year? Yes, we're doing virtual events for all of them. Channel uh, Con coming up here at the end of uh, uh, end of July, begin well beginning of August. Uh, the CompTIA Partner Summit coming up uh, just next uh, next week for us. Uh, you know, uh, mid mid to end of July. So that's really cool uh, stuff that's happening. And we are going to have some good uh, presentations about security and panels. We've brought in uh, people from around the world talking about these very uh, issues that we uh, we just discussed and what they're doing to uh, help solve the problem. And these are long-term problems that will require some long-term solutions. Perfect. And I know you have some speaking events coming up as well. A uh, couple for AFSIA first? Yeah. AFCIA, uh, or, or is it AFKIA? Just kidding. Um, it's, it is AFCIA. Yeah, it's a Korean uh, company. Some, yeah. <laughs> uh, doing some stuff in Baltimore, for example, uh, and, and also in Augusta. Those would be virtual events. Although the Baltimore one, I think we're uh, combining. No, uh, yeah, it, uh, the Augusta one, we're combining that, doing some in-person things. And then I should be heading over, uh, assuming everything continues to recover, uh, over to Hawaii to do a mini boot camp there. So oh, that's oh, the Indo-Pacific ones in Hawaii? Yeah, Indo-Pacific. Oh, that'll be nice. Yeah, it should be fun. That'll be nice. And then you've got uh, Billington Cybersecurity Summit in October. What? Where is Billington? Yep. Yep, Billington. Oh. Well, uh, it's a company uh, that they do a lot of cybersecurity oh. work and things like that. It's not a city. So, uh, yeah. It's <laughs> okay, a, it sounds like one in Montana. It does, doesn't it? it does, I'm like, yeah, Billington, like, Vermont? I don't know. Yeah. And then, it's just uh, down from Edmonton in Canada. Yeah, I, okay, that, that's where, yeah. yeah. And then uh, mini boot camp that you're doing on cloud security. Uh, that's the TechNet Cyber. That's the, the Baltimore event uh, you were talking about. That takes place on October 27th. And then, yeah, November for uh, Indo-Pacific. So you're on a on a board with FC, is that Yes, right? uh, on the Cybersecurity Council. The council. Uh, uh, as an industry representative, that's been a lot of fun working uh, with the FCF folks, uh, mostly uh, com uh, in combination with the Department of Defense, the uh, United States Department of Defense, and uh, um, you know, the Washington, D.C. crowd or whatever. But it's really been fantastic to get to d get to know them there. Yeah, uh, we've, we, we've exhibited at that show a couple times up in Baltimore, and it's a lot of fun and, and great, yeah. great conversations. It's really cool to see the the private sector kind of come together with the, with the really DOD neat. side. And, yeah. 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 It's exciting. And, and it's, it's fun because uh, uh, there's, it's, you know, it can really come to loggerheads always in good, good nature and all that stuff. But it's really interesting to see those two different major cultures come together. Exactly. I'm also doing a lot of work. Uh, I do webinars all the time, doing one here coming up in India. I didn't even mention that one earlier. Uh, doing one for, for India here. I'm not uh, waking up that awesome. early. <laughs> <laughs> it's 430. It'll be 430 my time, awesome. but it'd be, It'd be seven thirty. So yeah, okay. I'm still yeah, not waking he's still, up. I was gonna say, he's not awake. There's no way. Yeah. Uh, will it be recorded? I will be watching. Uh, yes, it is. There it will go. be recorded. I'll Perfect. throw you your URL. Yeah. Perfect. Well, James, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure when we have you on to kind of hear, you know, where things are with CompTIA and, and what's coming up and, and all the fun things you're working on. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Definitely. Anytime, man. Yeah, thanks, all James. Best. All right, everybody stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break, come back and talk about the news this week on TechNATO with Don Pizzette. Are you a fan of TechNATO with Don Pizzette? Then show your love by voting for the show in the 16th Annual People's Choice Podcast Awards. To vote, head to podcastawards.com and register. Then you'll be taken to the voting page. TechNATO with Don Pizzette is under the This Week in Tech Technology category. Thanks for your vote and for your continued support of TechNATO with Don Pizzette. All right, welcome back to TechNATO with Don Pizzette without Don Pizzette. As we're doing it this week, 
Data, nice. data, dump is it, no dump is it. It's, it's all confusing. But thank you so much <laughs> to Dr. Stanger for joining us and giving us all that insight. He's also always fun, and I'm glad to see uh, his office is cleaned up, even if it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a lot of news to get to, and uh, Wes and Ronnie are going to help us break it down. So let's go ahead and look at our first one here from TechRadar.com. Microsoft Edge just left a serious rival in its dust. <laughs> Edge puts daylight between itself and... And Mozilla Firefox, and uh, are are you guys? What you're on? You're on a uh, a Mac, on a Ronnie. Mac. Yeah, you're yeah, on a I'm on running, PC. I'm running Windows. Yeah. So, are you an Edge guy or Wes? Or do well, you uh, yeah, I use uh, Edge pretty heavily. It uh, allows me to download uh, Chrome in the Brave oh, browser. Man. You know, that's its, that's its, its whole guys. existence. Yes, I'm one of those guys. So, <laughs> but so I have been using a little bit more, though. I have to say. Well, it it seems. I mean, people made fun of. IE for the longest time, and rightfully so. It was it was horrible. But you know, now that we're on kind of that Chromium base browser, from what I'm understanding, you know, it's gotten a bad rap, Edge, but it's actually a pretty good browser, right? It's, it's not really a bad fast. browser. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that I have problems is <laughs> with is just the the shock of uh, finally getting away from IE. Right, and so I'm kind of biased in that fact, and it's not Internet Explorer. They've got some pretty good built-in features that are, uh, you know, really good, and it is fairly fast too. And I hate to say this on the on the tech radar side, this guy uh, that wrote this article. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, talk about sensationalism. You know, Microsoft just left serious rivals in the dust, <laughs> yeah. and then you go down to the third paragraph. <laughs> Figures for June suggest Microsoft Edge now holds 3.4 percent of the browser market. While Firefox has slipped to 3.29. <laughs> this is like commentating a race. Yeah. And we're talking about the cars that are 14 laps down. Like, yeah, oh, he right. just passed that's it. Right. Did you see that? Yeah. That's right. Race I mean, is almost over. Now on, there's somebody just I starting. Now, granted, just that's left still... a serious rival in the dust. I mean, hey, but let's talk about that, right? I mean, you've dust. got Windows. It, it comes with Windows 10. Well, it's so baked and, in and now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what are you so, do? yeah, exactly. Um, if it was Firefox that was built into the operating system, wouldn't that be a reason that it would maybe leave Edge in the dust? But uh, yeah, so I, th I think some of those numbers uh, have to be yeah. taken with a uh, you know a little grain of salt. Well, I was curious too. I mean, this seems to be more about the um, maybe the fall of Firefox, which was I mean <laughs> very high yeah, up. I, right. I actually went back. I, w I went over to uh, StatCounter.com and I and I scrolled back as far as they would let me to see because I was like God, Firefox was pretty high. Well, I looked the at the peak. It was about uh, let's see this November two thousand nine. Firefox was at thirty one point uh, eight percent, mm -hmm. and this is a point where IE was still fifty five percent and on a you know pretty steady decline. Chrome was only at four point six percent. So I mean that's nuts if you look at that. I mean basically, I mean Chrome and Firefox switched places, and then Chrome just. Kept Ram. going. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I was a Firefox user for years. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I went away from it. Maybe just because Chrome came out and, and it seemed so much better. But uh, do you guys still use Firefox at all? I stopped a while ago, and that was because, and they've long since fixed this, but uh, I think it was uh, about five or six years ago, they had some serious memory leak issues where it would mm -hmm. just consume all your resources. So I got away with that. And just let's be transparent here. That's not the case anymore, but I just never circled back. Yeah. Now, Wes will attest to this. I, I try and use everything that there is built in to mm -hmm. the machine and try not to go third party if I don't really have to so I can learn more about the system. But, you know, the, the idea of Edge here and when they actually introduced it, it did have its hiccups. But now they've actually added some improvements into it. And, you know, they're harping that on that in the article, which is great. Pa a secure password generator, comparison tool, vertical tab bars, you name it, sleeping tabs. They They've tried to make it as much as they could equal to just about any other browser out there. So the features probably has, has helped it a little bit. But again, I think this is more of a sensational, you know, the, the title just makes you read it and it's like clickbait. You know, you, yeah. you kind of are, are scrolling through there and you click on like, ah, oh, that wasn't anything that they were really talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, and yeah. I think tech people like to like to rag on it, but if you're if you're just the average user, you're going to do what you said, Ron. You're going to open the browser that's built in, yeah. mm -hmm. and unless there's some reason where it's just screwing everything up, like it, like Internet yeah. Explorer was for the longest time, of yeah. you know things just not rendering the same as other browsers, you're going to stick with it, and, and I think you'll see those numbers continue to go up as Windows 11, you know, <laughs> uh, comes out, and, and it's even further baked in. At yeah, that point. yeah. The, the strange thing is the change pushes Edge into third position. So they had 3.4% of the browser market. The second place is 18.34. Was it Safari? Yeah, Safari. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you want to talk about the le leaving people in the dust, right? <laughs> That's right. That is leaving people <laughs> yeah. in dust. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is not even, I wouldn't even call it dust. I think Firefox is yeah. more leaving uh, <laughs> edge in the dust on its on its fall. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're declining this, faster than edge. This is was progressing. not edge moving up. This no, was Firefox moving up. Exactly. Down. All right, well, let's shift gears now and, uh, well, actually stay in the Microsoft world, but head over to our next article, which is from the techcommunity.microsoft.com blog, new certification for Microsoft team support engineers. So uh, with this Windows 11 announcement that we saw a few weeks ago, I mean, it seemed like Teams was kind of front and center now as, uh, you know, it's right there on the on the home screen. And, and so I guess this makes sense that we would be um, seeing specific certifications for uh, for teams, so is this something that uh, that you guys see? You know, people actually moving into these roles where you like have a dedicated Teams guy at your at your office. I think so. Mm -hmm. The very fact is the communication. Right at one point in just about every business, email was pretty much it. You know, you you and that was like the lifeblood of communication. But all these different ones that are out there today, Slack and Teams and and things like this, they've kind of taken over that point where unless your company is really just saying we'll never use that, they probably use Teams or Slack at this point where that's actually become the, the more natural uh, default mm -hmm. to be able to communicate internally with people. And it's reach, you know, when you actually get on Teams, you, you can actually connect with other people that's not inside your organization too, just like you can with Slack. So it being now built into the newer operating system in the background there's going to be a lot more support for it. So nobody has to download a third-party utility anymore, you know, not third-party, uh, another uh, addition, and it's in the operating system. Mm -hmm. I think you're just going to see it more. And so troubleshooting that, supporting that, uh, issues with that, they're just going to continue to rise uh, when it comes down to it. Definitely. And you, if you look about, you know, just even a couple of years ago or maybe a little bit longer than that, you know, unified communications was more of a side road, mm -hmm. right? It was it, not necessarily on the back burner, but it was, yes, we have this functionality. And if you need this functionality, you can bring all these communication types together. Uh, but then we had this thing called COVID hit. Uh, and now unified communications is allowing us to do and continue to thrive in, you know, a, a point in time where, we might not be able to if we had that. So I can see where they now they need and require more uh, experts uh, within this within this field. You know, within this you know what used to be just like a niche market. Uh, now it's front and center, and we see it all the time. Being able to work from uh, you know remote, work from home. Uh, so I think that's really what's kind of drived uh, the necessity to have more people in the industry that can focus within something that used to just be a small part of a larger role within an organization. And I think it proved to a lot of people what you can can accomplish virtually, uh, mm -hmm. where you know you felt you had to to fly before, and so even when COVID is over, you will continue to see uh, maybe uh, you know maybe not the same level, but you know th this adoption of of Teams and Zoom and, and other technologies like that. So I guess it does make sense, you know, that we will need to maintain those those systems. Um, but kind of at the same time as this is going on, it seems like uh, you know more in, in the behind the curtains Skype for business kind of going yeah. away. And, and that yeah. was, I mean, several years ago that, that Microsoft acquired them. But did they take like the best parts of Skype basically and put it in Teams and then say, okay, now we're scrapping this? Pretty much. Yeah. You know that that's kind of the the thing. They they had a beautiful company that they called Skype. Microsoft brought it, bought it, and then turned it into something that really was... Just gutted it for scrap, yeah. basically. Same thing with uh, Yammer. Well, you know, you know, I mean, it, it worked, and then yeah. it didn't work. Then they did the Skype for Business that didn't really work or, mm -hmm. you know, work. Uh, I can't remember. There's so many different variations of it. Yeah. I think this unifies, like, everything that they were trying to do once they took that uh, that video portion out of it mm -hmm. and said, look, now we have the, the chat platform that we need. Now we have the video part that we need. And we've got it now integrated into the operating system. It's going to be the biggest, uh, you know, uh, intercommunication, you know, uh, platform that's out there because every business that's running Windows is going to have it built in. It's changed our language. Think about it. We yeah. used to say, hey, we're going to get on a teleconference. We're going to get on a video call. Yeah, now we don't get... even really say that. We're going to get on a Zoom meeting or we're going to get we're going to Teams you. You know, we got verbs <laughs> yeah. surrounding this, you know, this type of technology today. But uh, it's nice to actually see this certification because mm -hmm. there are people that are going to be able to specialize in this. And really, you know, uh, have some that actually is going to be working in the future. Strangely, just not in cybersecurity. You know, it's it's it's, it's kind of strange. You know, because mm -hmm. every certification is really heading towards like cybersecurity this, cybersecurity that. This is a certification that really is outside of that particular realm or that track in You know, 
which is kind of neat and refreshing. Yeah, there still are jobs yeah. that aren't right. cybersecurity. That aren't cybersecurity. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> uh, which is a horrible segue to our next article, uh, <laughs> which is from Engadget.com. New York City launches a cyber defense center in Manhattan. Uh, it says Amazon, IBM, and the NYPD are some of the participants. So it sounds like they're kind of getting the... I mean, there's so many, you know, great minds, big companies there that they can actually pull that off uh, and and handle it at the local level. So what do you guys think about that? Is that is that the right way? Or are they basically saying, hey, the federal government hasn't hasn't done what we hoped they would do. So we got to handle this here. Yeah, I think we've in the past we've been very reactive to situations like this, and I think they're taking a proactive mm. stance, right? Because um, if you look at some of the ransomware attacks and stuff, some of the cybersecurity attacks that have gone on, we're talking about APT, advanced persistent, uh, you know, persistent threats, you know, organizations that have a lot of money thrown behind them, and small teams by themselves can't do this. So it's you know it's nice to have more of that that net network, that cybersecurity operation center together where they can take a proactive approach and they can get multiple teams together. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to have a lessons learned on Monday right after we've had a ransomware attack and half of our <laughs> infrastructure has collapsed on Saturday. Yeah. So, yeah, when, when, I, when I start reading this article, I, a couple of things come to mind. One is, obviously, at a federal government level, they have to deal with so many regulations. Everything has to slow down. So maybe whatever initiative that happened, it kind of got stuck at some point. And as much as they wanted to proceed, it just never really got to the point where it needed to. But New York City is actually in a very, you know, uh, neat uh, uh, situation here because they already have offices of who, – who is it there that's actually participating? Uh, including oh, Amazon, the Federal Reserve Bank, <laughs> IBM, the New York City Police Department, a huge, gigantic department, bigger than most – States have, you know, actual budgets a lot of times, healthcare, multiple providers that they were able to call on so many more resources to say, look, we, we can't focus on the entire nation, but we can protect what we have. And now that we're all within one sector or one particular regulation, uh, we can actually do it much more effectively. So I don't know if that actually ends up being true ultimately, but I, I think that's where they were like, look, we have the resources here that we need to, yeah. to do this. And we can actually mobilize it very quickly. Well, and it makes sense because that you know we've seen attacks on uh, the article mentions Baltimore, Atlanta right. that have had big uh, infrastructure attacks on their cities. But uh, you know this is something that's doable in New York, and and if it works there, great. But uh, this doesn't necessarily trickle down. You can't say you know well Gainesville, Florida can have this because you know we don't have those same resources, mm -hmm. we don't have right. those same companies. You can tap locally. So uh, I I hope that this this isn't seen as a replacement for what maybe should be happening at the federal level or uh, private industry or things like that because, yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, it's like everything else, right? Even if they do this, it doesn't mean that the company just goes, all right, now we've got this protection from New York City. Let's just, you know, forget about the rest of our yeah. security, you know. They still have to do the same things. And, and regardless of where we are, whether or not, you know, companies gather together to do this, uh, it's not going to be the same as the amount of resources that they have available. So... You know, I, I think that that's where, where this actually does have some nice uh, impact to it is to say, look, we've we finally gotten to this point where let's let's do all this and let's yeah. go ahead and not worry about the rest and we'll just handle what we can. And because of its prominence in our, you know, in the world, uh, you know, it, it says, look, we have to protect everything that we have because, you know, all the trading that goes on through New York City, I mean, that... Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty important to protect that stuff. But yeah. uh, you know, as 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 far as a model for other company or other cities, it's not necessarily something they can follow. But I'll be curious to see, like, if Newark, you know, just across the river, gets gets attacked, do they step in and say, "Hey, we can help because we have these resources"? Or they should you know, how, yeah, how, they should. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, how far will that reach go? I yeah, guess. and well, I mean, it's it's just better protection for them, right? If they can protect those entryways getting in, you know, it's one more layer of defense for them. So I don't know what will happen, but. Good, good try. That's what the I larger think. the larger <laughs> cities might become nexuses for smaller, you know, smaller uh, cities that can't afford it. Yeah, and yeah, and maybe it, it becomes a model that the states can adopt or something, right. and 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 do that way. But uh, yeah, what what's been happening till now is obviously not working. So <laughs> it's good to see uh, at least some new ideas and, and fresh stuff coming in here. All right, well, let's move over now to Slashdot.org for our next story. Uh, the big one we, we talked about a little bit with Dr. Stanger. Uh, uh, no, actually, this is, this is a different one. Uh, Kaspersky Password Manager fixes flaw that generated easily brute-forced passwords. And and this one was, was interesting to me because mm -hmm. we're, uh, 
you know, we, we rely on these password managers to uh, generate these super secure passwords for us. And we go, mm -hmm. well, that, you know, that's not one that's going to be in the, in the dictionary and going to be found. But it turned out, what, what was it, something about the, the time af affected how these passwords were generated? Yeah, they, uh, they use for their entropy, they essentially use timestamps. And uh, apparently it's not pseudo random enough. And um, it's one of those things that uh, they can reverse engineer. So does that mean if I, if I knew that you created your account at this time, I could figure out what that password should be or, or within a certain a range? A couple of elements, right? Yep. It was the way that Kaspersky used it in their particular uh, password creation manager. So, you know, it, it has two elements. Kaspersky used not only that timestamp, but they also used this algorithm, whatever we want to call it here, mm -hmm. that said, you know, it's going to look for these characters that don't appear as often, and it's going to generate passwords out of those. So there's more likely you're going to have those those things that we see on Wheel of Fortune, right? R, S, T, L, and N in yeah. passwords mm -hmm. rather than the letters X and G, J. Yeah, uh, and it, what it said, too, like you'll see combinations of, of letters like T and H would be right. together a lot, S, H, things like that. So you're not going to see Q and X yeah. and Z and R and X to each other, so that they would use those. But but again, if you're if, if you're writing, uh, you know, rules for this, mm -hmm. they can probably figure that out. And, well, and put once, that... They, once they realized it was Kaspersky doing it, then they could actually realize that the timestamp, too, was pretty much the only thing that they were using as being the key, you know, the, the timestamp being the, the key to entropy there. Then they, they were able to, to find out something else, is that if they ran a password within a minute, that they could actually generate the exact same password again which is not supposed to happen to something that's called a random password generator. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, and we've discussed in, in the yeah. past about, you know, is there true random, and you got to use, like, quantum, uh, you yeah. know, Yeah, that's the big debate. Like is, that. Are yeah. Thing, things that at best are pseudo-random. Yeah, and this, yeah. this <laughs> proves that something that's marketed as random, random number generators, it, it's not. It's coming from, uh, from something, and, and if the bad guys can figure that out, you're screwed, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. But it, it sounds like this was responsibly disclosed and, and patched at this point, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah, as yeah. far as I can tell. They just ch changed the logic in the way they generate the passwords. I think the other thing that makes this scary is the amount of trust people put into these generators, um, you know, into this type of technology. So you think, hey, well, I've generated a secure password. You mentioned it when we uh, first started talking about the article, and yeah. you set it and forget it, walk away. Uh, so... Well, and this uh, is why, personally, I, I only use the names of my pets and yes, the number one. Yes, dictionary words, that's right. Cap that's right. I capitalize yeah. numbering systems. Yep, capitalize the it. first letter, because they'll never guess that. That's, that's and right. then I put that's the number right. one on the end of it. And then write it on a post-it stamp and stick it to the keyboard. So I, I'm a LastPass guy. Are you guys as I'm well? Last I mean, because it's kind well. of what yeah. we use at the company. Yeah, but, I use LastPass personally, yeah. too. Yeah, and that just... Now I gotta, I'm got i curious, though, how are they generating their passwords? What What is their random It's a good question to ask, and hopefully they should be able to answer that on their website. Yeah. You know, that, that this is something that they've tried over and over again and that they're not going to get what Kaspersky ended up getting. I wonder if something like this makes people look vertically, Should. you know, or <laughs> horizontally. I, I know how directions work, you know. <laughs> and, uh, look to the next person and say, um, you know, well, well, how are you doing it? Yeah, and you know, you know, LastPass saw this right away, and 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 the other, all the other providers that, yeah. that provide the service, and, and said, hey, let's check our system and make sure. Well, that it's interesting doing it in right. the Edge browser that we were talking about. That's one of the features is the secure password generator. So, oh, they, Microsoft's got that built in. <laughs> yeah, there. yeah, they're built. That's one of the functionalities that they're building in there. So it kind of makes you take pause and say, okay, uh, let's check all of them. All right. Well, we've got some more bad news in our next article uh, from bleepingcomputer dot com. Microsoft says SEO poisoning used to backdoor targets with malware. And I, I had never heard this term SEO poisoning before, but it sounds like they're just basically making big documents with malicious code in it that are just full of keywords that uh, are going to get those uh, those documents kind of pushed up in the search engine. Am I understanding that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty much how it actually goes, right? Those The way that SEO works is the more that they can find that term, the easier that they make it. Those uh, search engines pull that towards the, the top edge. So people do what then? Click on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, mean, I thought Google was smarter than this, honestly, though. I mean, because people are playing the game with Google all the time of trying to get up higher in the search engines. And, I mean, this sounds like just blatant keyword stuffing that, uh, you know, wouldn't have good context and things like that. But I guess, you know, you don't need to be number one if you are if you can get it just high enough where someone's going to click on that. And, and what is this, like macros then running? Like, I, I Well, uh, in one yeah. they talked about, you know, uh, so think of, think of the scenario here where something's free, whatever it might be, you know, a free 
uh, like they mentioned, forms and stuff, mm -hmm. and you download a PDF, and that PDF doesn't actually contain the code, but for what you need, that free part of it re requires you to download another PDF. Oh. You download a second PDF, and again, now we have a way to um, uh, get into your system. It's basically just don't hit enable macros on anything that you download. <laughs> from <laughs> That's right. a good idea. External. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that uh, it uh, we actually had some some notes here uh, suggested you kind of use something like Virus Total to run. Uh, run files before you open them. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's one of those things where, you know, it sounds good in practice, but are people actually going to take the time to download something and then, you know... It, well, well, there's a good thing about that because, for instance, the operating systems, a lot of the operating systems in the web browsers will have that built in. I don't know. I know here... Oh, well, they'll scan it before Yeah, they you scan it before. It. Now, it's how safe is that software and what is that process? I, I, I really don't know. But you are seeing things like, for instance, uh, the smart screen filtering that's been in m Windows for gosh, I want to say since Windows 7, where it does exactly that. It looks uh, for reputation-based. That's another technology that they put reputation-based scanning and says, hey, did this come from a reputable site, right? And um, does it have these, you know, this certain uh, built, uh, you know, structure? And it's a lot of times it's built into the operating system or more so built in the browsers because it's not necessarily the operating system that's going to be searching for these, you know, these locations. You're going to be using a web browser. But then you have other things that are built into the operating system that do kind of holistically work together to help stop that but as a company you, you'd expect maybe that you'd have something on your own network that's like a firewall that, that's looking at this stuff before it, it gets to the end user yeah well it starts with at training. least a filter right so mm -hmm. but you know the, the same thing is end user training it is once again of what needs to happen here is that if you're downloading something you should know who you're downloading from and if you're kind of question like i know that i'm supposed to download from here but i know i can get it somewhere else then you, you don't really know unless you do something like virus total mm -hmm. to allow you to actually see what's in that. So it's it's just it really comes down to that end user training once yeah. again because without that, I don't care what you put in place, somebody will figure out how you're gonna compromise something. <laughs> yeah, just, I think as the end yeah. user, just ask yourself the question, is this worth my job? Yeah. That's uh, right. <laughs> because it could, That's right. it could yeah. cost you that if you open that. Because we I mean we talk about it, it, James was talking about, you know, Target. It goes back to Somebody installing an AC uh, that that's open to the, the internet. I mean, you know, one person, one small thing can can trigger yeah. something that is catastrophic and, and impacts the company for years and years. So, uh, all right, that's a good one. Oh, uh, we have one more segment that we wanted to look at. Something mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I'm not sure which one of us found this, but we got some new tech. So let's do new tech this week. New tech this week. We got the scoop. All right, this one uh, comes to us. Uh, it's The website is wificard.io, uh, so check that out. But uh, it is a, a system that basically generates a QR code for your Wi-Fi login. So you put in your network name, you put in the password, and uh, and you can choose to, to hide or show the password field before printing, and then it lets, uh, you know, People that come over, your guests just scan that, and and that's been a bit. I mean, QR codes have been around for a while. They they didn't really blow up like I think marketing <laughs> people hoped that they would. But uh, with COVID, we've been seeing that all the time now with menus where you just go and you click on that. But that's opening a browser page. I didn't I didn't realize that a QR code could actually then kind of populate and, and help you join a, a network. So that, that's, sure. that's really cool. Is this something that you guys went might put in, in your homes? Oh, I would absolutely mm -hmm. do this. This would help me remember my uh, Wi-Fi password <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> without having to reset yeah. the router every time I need to yeah. uh, do something to it. So this is even better, like, if you do happen to have, let's say, a rental property or something and mm -hmm. you provide Wi-Fi, instead of writing the code down, you just post this up and just say, here's the Wi-Fi login, and they scan it mm -hmm. with their devices and they're able to get in without you having to tell them the network name or the password. They're just able to get in. Now, here's the, the real tricky thing, though, is that uh, somebody might actually look at this and go, hey, uh, where is this coming from, though? You know, where is this uh, uh, QR code coming from? It's generated directly in your browser, which means it's on your side. Mm -hmm. So it's not coming off of a server that we're downloading, which means it's not going to be something that's going to be where somebody grabs it in transit or anything. Mm -hmm. This is actually generated on your computer for your side. 
making it much more secure. Yeah, so because this this sounds like a great phishing attack where yeah. they say, hey, just tell us your Wi-Fi name and your password, yeah. and yeah. we'll give Why you this not? cool QR yeah. code. But uh, Don actually said, too, that, that he went through this and, and ran it, and and everything, uh, nothing was transmitted back. So so that's uh, that's something that, that does seem safe. I will say, uh, when you hit generate and print, um, it's ugly. So if you are <laughs> going to print this out and maybe put it in your home, you could probably just copy the QR code and, and put it on your own document mm-hmm. or something and, and yeah. make some pretty... Uh, or do a know. screenshot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take a screenshot of it and put it in, in your own document and just uh, maybe do it that way. But, uh, but that's kind of a cool idea and something... Uh, well, I know a lot of people set up like a guest network either, mm-hmm. well, definitely at their business, but even mm-hmm. at their home. So, you know, you could have that there. And uh, Yeah, I had a friend that was using QR codes to um, configure different <laughs> profiles on his mobile phone. <laughs> uh, so when he was at work, he had one that was configured to turn the volume down or the, the alarms off, you so know, you do all that, silence really? the yeah. phone. And all he had to do is come in, <laughs> touch that to his phone, and it would reconfigure it. Now, the lift that it took to get there yeah. is maybe not worth it, but uh, yeah. yeah. So the... I'm always I always laugh when I see a QR code because at one point in time, uh, a friend of ours actually ended up putting a QR code on some T-shirts, trying to advertise you know the biz, and it actually went to his personal page. <laughs> well, you know he had started putting an email you okay. know on the on the the signature line of everything you know personal thing, but when they generated the T-shirts, they copied the wrong one. Oh. <laughs> so, so that's a public service announcement. Yeah, Get it, your configurations it, it correct. Makes me like, I, we, we knew what he was trying to do. Yeah. But overall, though, you know, you're, you're like, everybody, so when we all went to a park, one of the, the theme parks right around here, yeah. you know, everybody was kind of like, who the heck is this? <laughs> what is this about? <laughs> we're we're going to chase somebody, yeah, like scanning right. their shirt, too, like that. I, and and I don't get putting a, a, a QR code, like, in an email signature. Put the put the link. That's no, the no. Whole. See, well, at one point, it was, like you said, it was that new thing. And, yeah. You know, I thought it was going to go big, and mm-hmm. you know, it went just exactly where I went. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool, because as you're actually typing in this, you're seeing the, the code change. Yeah, change. So I, I, I wonder... I, like like I said, you could hide the password field before printing, but can can these things be like reverse engineered to, you know, be put into text? That so, I'm not yeah, sure. I wonder if someone could so. get that password out of there. Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously, you're putting this in an area where you're, uh, you know, it's people you trust anyway at that point. So yeah. um, maybe don't put it in the front window. That's true. Uh, That's <laughs> fixing true. Fixing out, but but if you have the uh, any Amazon or Ring devices, you already are giving out Wi-Fi to the whole That's neighborhood. That's true. You pretty much are. So. Um, <laughs> it's the nature of Wi-Fi anyway, radiated energy. Yeah, right? you're, you're sharing, <laughs> and sharing is caring. All right, well, I want to let you know about a couple things coming up from IT Pro TV. First, we have a webinar that is a uh, first look at updated CompTIA CASP Plus, which is taking place Thursday, July 22nd. Adam Gordon is going to be looking at that and talking about the new exam objectives that drop in August. That's taking place, uh, like I said, the 22nd of July, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So head over to itpro.tv slash webinars. You can register for that. Uh, we're also uh, going to be playing CompTIA Jeopardy a little bit later this month, and you guys are both contestants, right? Ooh, oh. Yeah, I'll be hosting the webinar, nice. too. That'll be fun. That a, oh, yeah, you're on that webinar with that. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. Fantastic. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about CompTIA Jeopardy um, soon, but that's going to be uh, the last Friday of July, which is a th- the 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That'll be on, IT, on IT Pro TV's on-air page. Uh, so you can just head over there, create a free account, uh, and you can watch the fun uh, with us live. And then uh, while you're on the internet, head over to technado.com. You can check out the latest episodes. You can send in listener mail. Let us know what segments to talk about or give us your opinion on what we talked about today, as long as it's nice. I, I won't read the things to, uh, to these guys that aren't nice. They don't have the thick skin like, like Don and Daniel do. Um, but you can click that big orange button in the upper right-hand corner. It says sponsored by, by IT Pro TV, and you can get 30% off the lifetime of your personal membership uh, to IT Pro TV. Uh, that carries with you as long as you keep it active. And you can also request a team trial and see all the great features available for businesses uh, at IT Pro TV as well. So check that out, technado.com. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, Sure. I know, know, like I said, you guys are filming content, and we took you away from that, but we really appreciate you uh, filling in and and, uh, and sharing your insight and and talking with James. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. You would have actually been able to say Technado with, well, no one if we didn't show up. If you didn't show up, I said it was just going to be me reading the articles, <laughs> which, you know, might have been more informative. I don't know. Probably. I, yeah, we, maybe we try that one week and we see if it's just, uh, I mean, you can just give voice to text on your computer and, or text to speech and let it do that and you don't need me. Hmm. But, sure. but we're curating the articles. We're picking the good ones for you. 
All right, anyway, uh, that's going to do it for us this week. we got more CompTIA month uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, so be looking out for that. And we will see you guys next week right here on Technado with Don Pizzette.